Hello! Hello, my friends! Welcome to Kong's Corner, the show where I slowly and gradually turn into Augustus Gloop from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But really, I'm reading Harry Potter every single day, every single weekday. We started a couple of months ago. I've never read Harry Potter before. It's my first time, so please don't ruin anything in the chat or comments or else the the, the anger and rage of the gods will rain down upon your head! <sighs> Uh, so last time, where we left off, uh, what, what we found out was Voldemort's heritage, in a way. He came up from a pretty messed up family, a pretty angry family, a pretty proud family. His mom, uh, put a spell on some dude she liked, and, uh, a, a, love, spo a love potion spell. And he fell in love with her, had Voldemort. But uh, she thought for some reason, maybe that once that spell was lifted, he would stay with her. Didn't happen. He peaced out. He was like, I'm out. I don't know who you are anymore. You're not the woman I married. And uh, has now, uh, he, we don't know exactly what happened to his mother. I bet she comes back into play. I bet she does. But uh, now uh, that's what Voldemort, sh uh, no, no, uh, Dumbledore showed Harry. So now we're on to chapter 11, Hermione's Helping Hand. So we're going to get started pretty quick here. Uh, just letting you know, this week I am uh, going to go out of town to visit my parents. I'm going to stay there for a little while. So things are going to look a bit different here. Uh, they're going to have this background. I'm going to go back to basics. But uh, Wednesday and Thursday this week, I will not be reading. So tomorrow I will be. Friday I will be. But Wednesday and Thursday, I will not. If you want to keep track of all these things or announcements that I make in case you don't see the videos that often, check out our Discord in the link links in the link below. And uh, I, I do announcements about when I'm reading them on there, if that's what you want to know. Okay, let's get going. Hope you're all doing good. We're going to start with Chapter 11, Hermione's Helping Hand. She's, she's going to chop her hand off and put it on Dumbledore's. Oh, your, <laughs> your hand isn't working. Here, have mine. <laughs> okay. As Hermione had predicted, the sixth year's free periods were not the hours of blissful relaxation Ron had anticipated, but times in which to attempt to keep up with the vast amount of homework they were being set. Not only were, were they studying as though they had exams every day, but the lessons themselves had become more demanding than ever before. Harry barely understood half of what Professor McGonagall said to them these days. <laughs> That's like me all throughout high school. <laughs> um... Even Hermione had to ask, had had to ask her to repeat instructions once or twice. Incredibly, and to Hermione's increasing resentment, Harry's best subject had suddenly become potions, thanks to the Half-Blood Prince. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Non-verbal spells were now expected, but only in defense against the dark arts, but in charms and transfiguration too. Harry frequently looked over at his classmates in the common room or at mealtimes to see them purple in the face and straining as they had overdosed on you-know-poo. Okay, what? <laughs> Pay purple in the face and straining as, as though, okay, I thought they had overdosed on it. As though, though they had overdosed on you-know-poo. I... If this is a spell or a potion that you give somebody, the, the you know poo, it's where they just fill up with poo and they can't poo and they're basically just constipated. I am in with this universe. The, everything else before the, uh, this, every single book, you know, I wasn't really sold. But this one detail, man, I am in. You know poo, you got me. You know poo, you know me. <laughs> All right. Fred and George's invention. Gotcha. Uh, wizard, Weasley, Wizard, Weezes joke product. Indeed, it was when a. When you gotta go, you it's know. Time. It's no. time. All right. Uh, but he knew that they were really struggling to make spells work without saying incantations aloud. It was, a it was a relief to get outside into the greenhouses. They were dealing with more dangerous plants than ever in her herbology. But at least they were still allowed to swear loudly if the venomous tentacula seized them unexpected unexpectedly from behind. Oh, that was a fun class. 
One result of their enormous workload was the frantic hours of practicing non-verbal spells was that Harry, Ron, and Hermione had so far been unable to find time to go and visit Hagrid. Oh, poor guy. He had stopped coming to meals at the staff table, an ominous, uh, ominous sign. And on the few occasions when they had passed him in the corridors or out in the grounds, he had mysteriously failed to notice them or hear their greetings. Oh, he is miffed. He is miffed. Hagrid is not happy. We've got to go and explain, said Hermione, looking up at Hagrid's huge empty chair at the staff table the following Saturday at, at breakfast. We've got Quidditch tryouts this morning, said Ron, and we're supposed to be practicing that Ogo Ogomenti charm for Flitwick. Anyway, explain what? How are we going to tell him we hate this stupid subject? We didn't hate it, said Hermione. Speak for yourself. I haven't forgotten the scroots, said Ron darkly. And, I'm telling you now, we've had a narrow escape. You didn't hear him going on about his gormless brother. We'd have been teaching Grob how to tie his shoelaces if he'd stayed. <laughs> I hate not I hate not talking to Hagrid, said Hermione, lo looking upset. We'll go down after Quidditch, Harry assured her. He too was missing Hagrid, although like Ron, he thought they were better off without Grob in their lives. But trials might take all morning. N the number of people who have applied. He felt slightly nervous at confronting the first hurdle of his captaincy. I don't know why the team's this popular all of a sudden. Uh, the constipation sensation that's gripping the nation. Mo Luther, excellent work. Excellent work. Yeah, don't tell John that Vader is his father and that he will destroy the Death Star with the Enterprise. <laughs> Hello, important nobody. All right. Oh, come on, Harry, said Hermione, suddenly impatient. It's not Quidditch that's pop popular, it's you. You've never been more interesting, and frankly, you've never been more fancy uh, fanciable. Hmm. Has Hermione got a little, uh, a little bit of a... Oh, Harry, we've been, we've been friends for so long, and I have feelings for Ron, but really... It's you I've wanted all along. Please, let me kiss your scar better. Mwah. Here's another one. Mwah. And here's a third one. Mwah. Oh, sorry, I did a hat trick right there. All right, let's keep going. Um, Ron gagged on a large piece of kipper. <laughs> Hermione spared him one look of disdain before turning back to Harry. <laughs> uh... Okay, uh, every, uh, so who's saying this? Ron saying this? It doesn't say it. One look before turning back to her, or Hermione. Everyone knows you've been telling the truth now, don't they? The whole wizarding world has had to admit that you were right about Voldemort being back, and that you really have fought him twice in the last two years and escaped both times. And now they're calling you the chosen one. Well, come on. Can't you see why people are fascinated by you? Harry was finding the Great Hall very hot all of a sudden, even though the ceiling still looked cold and rainy. <laughs> and you've been through all that per uh, persecution from the Ministry when they were trying to make out you were unstable and a liar. You can still see the marks where that evil woman made you write with your own blood. But you stuck to your story anyway. Um... You can still see where those brains got hold of me in the ministry. Look, said Ron, shaking back his sleeves. And it doesn't hurt that you've grown about a foot over the summer either. Hermione finished, ignoring Ron. She is, uh, seems like she's all about Harry right now. I'm tall, said Ron, inconsequentially. <laughs> oh, Ron, Ron's jealous. Oh, I didn't expect this. I'm not jealous. Who's jealous? You're jealous. The post owls arrived, swooping down through rain-flecked windows, scattering everyone with droplets of water. <laughs> Most people were receiving more posts than usual. Anxious parents were keen to hear from their children and to children and to reassure them, in turn, that all was well at home. Harry, Harry had received no mail since the start of term. His only regular correspondence now was dead. And, and although he had hoped that Lupin might write occasionally, he had so far been disappointed. He was very surprised, therefore, to see the snowy white Hedwig circling 
Hedwig, circling amongst all the brown and gray owls. She landed in front of him, carrying a large, square package. A moment later, an identical package landed in front of Ron, crushing beneath it his minuscule and exhausted owl, Pigwitchin! <laughs> I know this didn't happen, but what if Big Widgeon just straight up died? Just so unceremoniously. Just straight up, bam, done. <laughs> ha! said Harry, unwrapping the parcel to reveal a new copy of advanced potion making, fresh from Flourish and Blots. Oh, good, said Hermione. Delighted. Now you can give that graf graffiti copy back. Are you mad? said Harry. I'm keeping it. Look. I've thought it out. He pulled out, he pulled the old copy of advanced potion making out of his bag and tapped the cover with his wand, muttering, Defendo! The cover fell off. He did the same thing with the brand new book. Hermione looked scandalized. <gasps> oh! He then swapped the covers, tapped each, and said, Repero! There sat the prince's copy, disguised as a new book, and there sat the fresh copy from Flourish and Blots. Looking thoroughly secondhand, there's going to be a moment where uh, he, you know, the teacher is going to say, look up this and this page and it's not going to be in his version or something. I'll give Slughorn back the new one. He can't complain. It'll cost, it, it cost nine galleons. Hermione pressed her lips together, looking angry and disapproving, but was distracted by a third owl landing in front of her, carrying the day's copy of The Daily Prophet. She unfolded it and scanned the front page. Anyone we know dead? Asked Ron in a determinedly casual voice. <laughs> he posed the same question every time Hermione opened her paper. I can't wait till John starts writing fan fiction. Well, I won't write fan fiction. I might play fan fiction. Who knows? Uh, no, but there have been more Dementor attacks, said Hermione, and an arrest. Excellent. Who? said Harry, thinking of Bellatrix Lestrange. Stan Shunpike, Stan Shunpike, said Hermione. What? said Harry. Oh, here we go. Stanley Shunpike, conductor on the popular wizarding conveyance, the night bus, has been arrested on suspicion of Death Eater activity. Mr. Shunpike, 21, was taken into custody late last night after a raid on his Clapham home. That's it. <laughs> That's all we get. Stan Shunpike, a Death Eater, said Harry remembering the spotty youth he had first met three years before. No way! Okay, that's kind of crazy. That's the guy on the bus, right? Yeah. That dude. How is he a Death Eater? What did he do? He didn't do anything. He's cool. That dude was cool. All right. He might have been put under the Imperious Curse, said Ron reasonably. You can never tell. It doesn't look like it, said Hermione, who was still reading. It says here... He was arrested after he was overheard talking about the Death Eater's secret plans in a pub. She looked up with a troubled expression on her face. He was under the Imperious Curse. He'd hardly stand around gossiping about their plans, would he? Sounds like he was trying to make out he knew more than he did, said Ron. Isn't he the one who claimed he was going to become Minister for Magic when he was trying to chat up those Vila? Yep, that's him, said Harry. I don't know what they're playing at, taking Stan seriously. They probably want to look as though they're doing something, said Hermione. Yeah, probably. Frowning. People are terrified. You know the pa uh, Patil twins' parents want them to go home? And Elois Midgian has already been withdrawn. Her father picked her up last night. What? said Ron, goggling at Hermione. But Hogwarts are safer than their homes. Bound to be. We've got auras and all those extra protective spells. And we've got Dumbledore! I don't think we've got all the, him all the time, said Hermione very quietly. Oh, quietly. I don't think we've got him all the time, said Hermione very quietly, glancing towards the staff table over the top of the prophet. Haven't you noticed? His seat's been empty as often as Hagrid's this past week. Alleged Death Eater. Right. Wait till you find out how the Ministry of Magic is dealing with COVID. <laughs> Mo Luther, you got some bangers today. Some banger com comments. Harry and Ron looked up at the staff table. The headmaster's chair was, indeed, empty. Now Harry came to think of it, he had not seen Dumbledore since their private lesson a week ago. I think he's left school to do something with... Uh, I think he's left school to do something with the order, said Hermione in a low voice. I mean, 
It's all looking serious, isn't it? Harry and Ron did not answer. But Harry knew that they were all thinking the same thing. There had been a horrible incident the day before, when Hannah Abbott had been taken out of herbology to be told her mother had been found dead. Oof, yeesh. They had not seen Hannah since. Wow, a lot of people getting killed. There's a lot of turmoil. Hey? Does John live in a lava lamp? I do in I do indeed, Robbie. I do indeed. Check this out though. Ooh. When they left the Gryffindor table five minutes later. Oh wait, uh when they left the Gryffindor table five minutes later to head down to the Quidditch pitch, they passed Lavender Brown and Parvati Patil. Remembering what Hermione had said about the Patil twins' parents wanting to, to them to leave Hogwarts, Harry was unsurprised to see that the two best friends were whispering to whispering what way, saying what what way, were whispering together, looking distressed. What did surprise him was that when Ron drew level with, with them, Parvati suddenly nudged Lavender, who looked around and gave Ron a wide smile. Ron blinked at her, then returned the smile uncertainly. His walk instantly became something more like a strut. Harry resisted the temptation to laugh, remembering that Ron had refrained from doing so after Malfoy had broken Harry's nose. <laughs> Hermione, however, looked cold and distant all the way down the to the stadium through the cool, misty drizzle and departed to find a place in the stands without wishing Ron good luck. I forgot how dark this book is, Ifra Salim. Yeah, that's true. As Harry had expected, the trials look, took most of the morning. Half of Gryffindor House seemed to have turned up, from first years, who were nervously clutching the selection of the dreadful old school brooms, to seventh years, who towered over the rest, looking coolly intimidating. The latter included a large, wiry-haired boy Harry recognized immediately from the Hogwarts Express. Express. Cormac McLagan. Oh yeah, he's like, he's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, right, he's, he's talking like this, yeah. He, we met on the train in old Sluggy's compartment, he said co confidently, stepping out of the crowd to shake Harry's hand. Cormac McLagan, keeper. You didn't try out last year, did you? Asked Harry, taking note of the breadth of McL McLagan, McLagan's, McLagan, and thinking that he would probably block all three goal hoops without even move, moving. I was in the hospital wing when they held the trials, said McLagan with something of a swagger. Like a pound of doxy eggs for a bet. Right, said Harry. Well, if you wait over there. He pointed over the edge of the pitch, close to where Hermione was sitting. He thought he saw a flicker of annoyance pass over McLagan's face and wondered whether McLagan expected preferential treatment because they were both old Sluggy's favorites. Uh, when you first started this series, did you ever think it, it'd get this dark and relatable when it came to politics? Oh, when it came to politics? Uh, no, not really. No, I, I, I did hear that it get, you know, we go, uh, the first books are like kids books, but read on, it gets like grown up, it grows up to the audience, it gets darker. So I knew that, but not, not about politics. Nah, I did not. Um, all right. Harry decided to start with a basic task, test asking all applicants for the team to divide into groups of ten and fly once around the pitch. This was a good decision. The first ten was, ten was made up of first years, and it could not have been plainer that they had hardly ever flown before. Only one boy managed to remain airborne for more than a few seconds, and he was so surprised he promptly crashed into one of the goalposts, <laughs> seriously injuring himself for life. His spleen was broken. They had to bring him to the hospital, to Mrs. What's-Her-Face, Muppy. No, that's not her name, but I'll call her Muppy from now on. And nobody visited him, unfortunately. He was broken. He was a broken child. The second group comprised ten of the silliest girls ha Harry had ever encountered, who, when he blew his whistle, merely fell, ab fell about giggling and clutching with each other. Clutching each other. Oh, they're like goggling over him. Ramilda Vane was amongst them. Ramilda Vane, I can't remember who that was. When he told them to leave the pitch, they did so quite cheerfully and went to sit in the stands to heckle everyone else. Poppy. Poppy, not Muppy. Poppy Pomfrey. 
The third group had a pile up halfway around the pitch. Most of the fourth group had come without broomsticks. The fifth group were Hufflepuffs. If there's anyone else here who's not from Gryffindor, roared Harry, who was starting to get seriously annoyed. Leave now, please. There was a moment, and a couple of little Ravenclaws went sprinting out the pitch, snorting with laughter. After two hours, many complaints and several tantrums, one involved a crashed Comet 260 and several broken teeth, um, Harry had found himself three chasers. Katie Bell returned to the team after an excellent trial, a new find called Demelza Robbins, or Robins, Robins, not Robins, of course it's Robins, who is particularly good at dodging bludgers and bullets, and Ginny Weasley, who had outflown all the competition and scored 17 goals to boot. Pleased though he was with his choices, Harry had also shouted himself hoarse at the many complainers and was now enduring a similar battle with rejected beaters. That's my final decision, and if you don't get out of the way for the keepers, I'll hex you! He bellowed. She was the one who invited Harry on the express. I still don't remember. Neither of his chosen beaters had the old brilliance of Fred and George, but he was still reasonably pleased with them. Jimmy Peaks. Jimmy Peaks. That's a dope ass name. A short, a short but broad chested third third year. Whoa. <laughs> who had managed to raise a lump the size of an egg on the back of Harry's head with a ferociously hit bludger. And Richie Coot. <laughs> These names. Richie Coot, with an E at the end, Coote. Richie Coote, who looked weedy but aimed well. They now joined the spectators in the stands to watch the selection of their last team member. Harry had deliberately left the trial of the keepers until last, hoping for an emptier stadium and less pressure on all concerned. Oh, is it gonna be, be is it gonna be between Ron and somebody else? It's gonna be between Ron and somebody who's better than Ron. Unfortunately, however, all the rejected players and a number of people who had come down to watch after a lengthy breakfast had joined the crowd by now, so that it was larger than ever. As each keeper flew up towards the goalposts, the crowd roared and cheered in equal measure. Harry glanced over at Ron, who had, who had always had a problem with nerves. Harry had hoped that winning their final match last term might have cured it, but apparently not. Ron was a delicate shade of green. None of the first five applicants saved more than two goals apiece. To Harry's great disappointment, Cormac McLagan saved four penalties out of five. On the last one, however, he shot off in completely the wrong direction. The crowd laughed and booed, and McLagan returned to the ground, grinding his teeth. Uh. Ron looked ready to pass out as he mounted his clean sweep 11. Um, who's saying this? Good luck, cried a voice from the stands. Harry looked around, expecting to see Hermione, but it was Lavender Brown. He would have quite liked to have hidden his face in his hands, but as she did a moment later, but thought that as the captain he ought to show slightly more grit, and so turned to watch Ron do his trial. Yet he need not have worried. Ron saved one, two, three, four, five penalties in a row. Delighted and resisting joining in the cheers of the crowd with difficulty, Harry turned to McLagan to tell him that, most unfortunately, Ron had beaten him, only to find McLagan's red face inches from his own. He stepped back hastily. Okay. His sister didn't really try, said McLagan menacingly. There was a vein pulsing in his temple. Oh, he's got some anger problems like the one Harry had often admired, admired in Uncle Vernon's. She gave him an easy save. Rubbish, said Harry coldly. That was the one he nearly missed. McLagan took a step nearer Harry, who stood his ground this time. Give me another go. No, said Harry. You've had your go. You saved four. Ron saved five. Ron's keeper, he won at fair and square. Get out of my way. He thought for a moment that McLagan might punch him, but he contented himself with an ugly grimace and stormed away, growling what sounded like threats to thin air. Harry turned round to find his new team beaming at him. <laughs> well done, he croaked. You flew really well. You did brilliantly, Ron. This time it really was Hermione running towards them from the stands. Ooh! Harry saw Lavender walking off the pitch, arm-in-arm arm with Parvati. 
a rather grumpy expression on her face. Ron looked extremely pleased with himself and even taller than usual as he grinned around at the team and at Hermione. After fixing the, t the time of their first full practice for the following Thursday, Harry, Ron, and Hermione bade goodbye to the rest of the team and headed off towards Hagrid's. A watery sun was trying to break through the clouds now, and it had stopped drizzling at last. Harry felt extremely hungry. He hoped there would be something to eat at Hagrid's. I thought I was going to miss that fourth penalty. <laughs> Ron was saying happily, Frankie shot from Demel Demelza, did you see? Had a bit of a spit on it. Yes, yes, you were... Yes, 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 you were magnificent, said Hermione, looking amused. I don't know what's going on there. It was better than that McLagan, anyway, said Ron in a highly satisfied voice. Did you see him lumbering off in the wrong direction on his fifth? <laughs> Look, looked like he'd been conf uh, confunded. To Harry's surprise, Hermione turned a very deep shade of pink at these words. Ron noticed nothing. He was too busy describing each of his other penalties in loving detail. Did Hermione put a spell on him? Or on the ball? She put she put some kind of spell on McLagan or somebody. She <gasps> No, wait, 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 wait. No. No, uh, for a moment there I thought Harry's got the 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 luck potion. But her, I thought maybe Hermione put that on Ron or something like that. The great gray the great gray hippogriff Buckbeak was tethered in front of alliteration again. Great gray hippogriff Buckbeak g -g 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 was tethered in front of Hagrid's Hagrid's cabin. He clicked his ra razor sharp beak at their approach and turned his huge head towards them. Oh dear, said Hermione nervously. He's still a bit scary, isn't he? Come off it. You've ridden him, haven't you? Said Ron. Harry stepped forward and b bowed low to the hippogriff without breaking eye contact or blinking. That's from uh, third year, I think. After a few sec seconds, Buckbeak sank into a bow too. How are you? Harry asked him in a low voice, moving forward to stroke the feathery head. Missing him? But you're okay here with Hagrid, aren't you? Oi! said a loud voice. Hagrid had come striding around the corner of his cabin wearing a large flowery apron and carrying a sack of potatoes. His enormous boarhound, Fang, was at his heels. Fang gave a booming bark and bounded forwards. Get away from him. You'll have your fingers, though. What? Get away from him. You'll have your fingers. Oh, it's your lot. Fang was jumping at Hermione and Ron, attempting to lick their ears. Hagrid stood and looked at them for a split second, then turned and strode into his cabin, slamming the door behind him. What a mump! He's such a mump! <laughs> oh, oh dear, said Hermione, looking stricken. Don't worry about it, said Harry grimly. He walked over to the door and knocked loudly. Hagrid, open up, we want to talk to you. There was no sound from within. If you don't open the door, we'll blast it open, Harry said, pulling out his wand. Harry, said Hermione, sounding shocked. You can't possibly. Yeah, I can, said Harry. Stand back. Before he could say anything else, the door flew open again, as Harry had known it would. And there stood Hagrid, glowering down at him and looking, despite the flowery penny, uh, despite the flowery penny, positively alarming. I'm a teacher, he roared at Harry. A teacher, Potter. How dare you threaten to break down my door? I'm sorry, sir, said Harry, emphasizing the last word as he stowed his wand inside his robes. Hagrid looked stunned. Since when have you called me, sir? Since when have you called me Putter? Oh, very clever, growled Gat Hagrid. Very amu amusing. That's me, that's smart, innit? All right, come in then, you ungrateful little... Mumbling darkly, he stood back and let them pass. Hermione sc scurried in after Harry, looking rather frightened. Rather. Um. Mm -hmm. Well, said Hagrid grumpily, as Harry, Ron, and Hermione sat down around his enormous wooden table, Fang li laying his head immediately upon Harry's knee and drooling o all over his robes. What's this? Feel sorry for me? Reckon I'm lonely or some that? Hmm? <laughs> no, said Harry at once. We wanted to see you. 
We've missed you, said Hermione tremulously. <laughs> missed me, have ya? <laughs> snorted Haggard. Yeah, right. He stomped around, brewing up tea in his enormous copper kettle, muttering all the while. Finally, he slammed down three bucket-sized mugs of mahogany brown tea in front of them, and a plate of his rock cakes. Harry was hungry enough even for Hagrid's cooking and took one at once. Hagrid, said Hermione timidly. When he joined them at the table and started peeling his potatoes with a brutality that suggested that each tuber had done him a great personal wrong. We, we really wanted to carry on with care of magical creatures, you know. Hagrid gave another great snort. <laughs> Harry rather thought some bogeys landed on the potatoes and was inwardly thankful that they were not staying for dinner. We did, said Hermione. But none of us could fit into our time fit it into our timetables. Yeah, right, said Hagrid again. There was a funny squelching sound, and as and they all looked around. Hermione let out a tiny shriek, and Ron leapt out of his seat and hurried around the table away from the large barrel standing in the corner that they o had only just noticed. It was full of what looked like foot long foot long maggots. Slimy, white, and writhing. Oh, come on, Hagrid. What are they, Hagrid? Asked Harry, trying to sound rather interested rather than revolted. Okay. What are they, Hagrid? But putting them down, down his rock cake all the same. Oh, just giant grubs, said Hagrid. And they grow into, said Ron, looking apprehensive. They won't grow into nothing, said Hagrid. I got them to feed to Aragog. And with that warning, he burst into tears. Hagrid! cried Hermione, leaping up, hurrying around the table the long way to avoid the barrel of maggots and putting an arm around his, his shaking shoulders. What is it? Oh, it? It's him, gulped Hagrid, his beetle black eyes streaming as he mopped his face with his apron. apron. It's Aragog. Oh, I, I, I think he's dying. He's got ill over the summer, and he's not getting better. I, I, I don't know what I'll do if, if he... If he... Oh, we've been together for so long. Hermione patted Hagrid's shoulder, looking at a complete loss for anything to say. Wait, wait a second. Um, Who's Aragog? He, he, he's the, the... Wait, we got Fang the Hound... Buckbeak, the, uh, the the flying fortress outside. <laughs> um, Aragog, who's Aragog? Oh, the giant spider. He's so sad about the giant spider. Oh, uh, okay, right. Yeah, everybody's everybody, everybody. Thank you. Immediate answers. Hermione patted Hagrid's shoulder, looking at a complete loss for anything to say. Harry knew how she felt. He had known Hagrid to present a vicious baby dragon with a teddy bear, seen him croon over giant scorpions with suckers and stings, attempt to reason with his brutal giant of a half-brother, but this was perhaps the most incomprehensible of all his monster fancies, the gigantic talking spider, Aragog, that dwelled deep in the Forbidden Forest and which he and Ron had only narrowly escaped four years previously. There's no question mark at the end of that, but I felt that it was where it warranted. Is there, is there anything we can do? Hermione asked, ignoring Ron's frantic grimaces and head shakings. Oh, 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 I don't think there is Hermione, choked Hagrid, attempting to stem the flood of his tears. <laughs> see, see, the rest of the tribe, <laughs> Ar Aragog's family, they're getting a bit funny now he's ill. A bit restive. Yeah, I think we saw a bit of that side of them, said Ron in an undertone. <laughs> There's, yes, hearing about Aragog just reminding me that there's still a feral car in the forest, right? Right! There's still a feral car! <laughs> Going around, just running on instinct, trying to find oil, burrowing down the ground, just mating with anything metallic. <laughs> right, giant spider and his wife, Mozag. Ah, uh, where were we? 
After that, after that, the atmosphere lightened considerably, for although neither Harry nor Ron had shown any inclination to go and feed giant grubs to a murderous gargantuan spider, Hagrid seemed to take it for granted that they would have liked to have done and become have done and became his usual self once more. Oh, I always knew you'd find it hard to squeeze me into your timetables, he said gruffly, pouring them even more tea, even if you apply for time turners. We couldn't have done, said Hermione. We smashed the entire stock of Ministry time turners when we were there in the summer. It was in the Daily Prophet. Oh, she covered her bases. She covered her bases. A bit late, though. Oh, well then, said Hagrid. There's no way you could have done it. Oh, I'm sorry I've been, you know, I've just been worried about Ar Aragog. And I did wonder whether Pref Professor Grubbly Plank had been teaching you. Hmm? At which all three of them started categorically and untruthfully that Professor Grubbly Plank, who had substituted for Hagrid a few times, was a dreadful teacher, with the result that by the time Hagrid waved them off the premises at dusk, he looked quite cheerful. Good job. Good job. I'm starving, said Harry. Me too. Once the door had closed behind them, and they were hurrying through the dark and deserted grounds, he, uh, he had abandoned the dark and deserted grounds. He, uh, there we go. He had ab uh, no. He had abandoned the rock cake, a a cake after an ominous cracking noise from one of his back teeth. Why would you keep eating that? And I've got that detention with Snape tonight. I haven't got much time for dinner. As they came into the castle, they spotted Cormac McLagan entering the Great Hall. It took him two attempts to get through the doors. He ricocheted off the frame on the first attempt. What? Why? What? What? Ron merely guffawed gloatingly and strode off into the hall after him. But Harry caught Hermione's arm and held her back. What? said Hermione defensively. You ask me. You ask me, said Harry quietly. McLagan looks like he was confounded and he was standing right in front of where you were sitting. Oh. Hermione blushed. Oh, all right then, I did it, she whispered. But you should have heard the way he was talking about Ron and Ginny. Anyway, he's got a nasty temper. You saw how he, how he reacted when he didn't get in. He wouldn't have wanted someone like that on the team. No, said Harry. No, I suppose that's true. But wasn't that dishonest, Hermione? I mean, you're a prefect, aren't you? Oh, be quiet, she snapped, and he smirked. What are you two doing? demanded Ron, reappearing in the doorway to the great hall and looking suspicious. Nothing, said Harry and Ron, uh, Harry and Hermione together, and they hurried after Ron. See, this is Hermione's deal. She always follows the rules, but, you know, the last couple of times in the, in the books when she's just kind of dismissive the things that you're supposed to do, it's always been out of uh, love and out of care for something or for someone. And she loves Ron to bits. That's what I think. So she's dismissing honesty and the way things should be done. Kind of a flaw. Kind of a flaw. It's a good thing. No, it's, it's a double-sided coin like everything. It's a good thing, but it's also a flaw. Uh, the smell of roast beef made Harry's stomach ache with hunger. But they had barely taken three steps towards the Gryffindor table when Professor Slughorn appeared in front of them, blocking their path. Harry! Harry! Oh, ho, ho, just the man I was hoping to see! Oh, that was all over the place. He boomed genially, twiddling the ends of his walrus mustache and puffing out his enormous belly. I was hoping to catch you before dinner. What do you say to a spot of supper tonight in my, room in, in my rooms instead? We're having a little party. Just a few rising stars. I've got McLagan coming, and Zabini, the charming Melinda Bobbin. I don't know whether you know her. Her family owns a large chair, a chain of apothecaries, and, and, of course, I hope, I hope very much that Miss Granger will favour me by coming too. This guy. Just constantly networking, huh? This dude. Slughorn made Hermione a little bow as he finished speaking. It was though, as though Ron had not pr uh, was not present. Slughorn did not so much as look at him. I can't come, Professor, said Harry at once. I've got a detention with Professor Snape. Oh, dear, said Slughorn, his face falling comically. 
Dear, dear! I was counting on you, Harry. Well, nay, I'll just have to have a word with Severus and explain the situation. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to persuade him to postpone your detention. <laughs> yep, yeah, I'll see you both later. He bustled out of the hall. He's got no chance of uh, persuading Snape, said Harry. The moment Slughorn was out of your shop, this, det this detention's already been postponed once. Snape, Snape did it for Dumbledore, but he won't do it for anyone else. Oh, I wish you could come. I don't want to go on my own, said Hermione anxiously. Harry knew that she was thinking about McLagan. Oh, I, I doubt you'll be alone. Ginny will probably be invited, snapped Ron, who did not seem to have taken kindly to being ignored by Slughorn. After dinner, they made their way back to Gryffindor Tower. The common room was very crowded, as most people had finished dinner by now, but they managed to find a free table and sat down. Ron, who had been in a bad mood ever since the encounter with Slughorn, folded his arms and frowned at the ceiling. Hermione reached out for a copy of the Evening Prophet, which somebody had ha had left abandoned on a chair. Anything new? said Harry. Not really. Hermione had opened the newspaper and was scanning the inside pages. Oh, look! Your dad's in here, Ron! He's all right! He, she, she added quickly. For Ron had looked round in alarm. It's, it just says he's been to visit the Malfoy's house. The second search of the Death Eaters residence does not seem to have yielded any results. Arthur Weasley out of the uh, uh, Arthur Weasley of the Office for the De Arthur Weasley of the Office for the Detection and Confiscation of Counterfeit Defensive Spells and Protective Objects that said that his team has been acting upon a confidential tip-off. Yes, I'm sorry. I know I didn't read that right. The, the teleprompter is just not working. No, it's too slow. That's why I had to repeat it three times because the lines weren't moving up qu quick enough. Oh, listen here. Look, I've been doing this job for 25 years. Don't you tell me how to work. Look, just leave me alone. I know how to read this. Oh, sod off. Yeah, mine, said Harry. I told him at King's Cross about Malfoy and that thing he was trying to get Borgen to fix. Well, if it's not at their house, he must have bought whatever it is to Hogwarts with him. But now he can... But how can he have done, Harry? Said Hermione, putting down the newspaper with a surprised look. We were all searched when we arrived, weren't we? Were you? Said Harry, taken aback. I wasn't. Oh, no, of course you weren't. I forgot you were late. Well, Filch ran over all of us with secrecy sensors when we got into the entrance hall. Any dark object would have been found. I know for a fact Crabbe had a shrunken head confiscated. So you see, Malfoy can't have brought in anything dangerous. That's canon, by the way. <laughs> Momentarily stymied, Harry watched Ginny Peasley playing um, playing with Arnold, the pygmy puff, for a while before seeing a, a way around this objection. Okay, what kind of what kind of what kind of sounds do pygmy puffs make? That is for That's a pygmy puff for you. Um. Someone sent it to him by owl, then, he said. His mother or someone. All the owls are being checked, too, said Hermione. Filch told us so when he was jabbing those secrecy sensors everywhere he could reach. Really stumped this time, Harry found nothing else to say. There did not seem to be any way Malfoy could have brought a dangerous or dark object into the school. He looked hopefully at Ron, who was sitting with his arms folded, staring over at Lavender Brown. Can you think of... Can you think of any way Malfoy... Oh, drop it, Harry, said Ron. Listen, it's not my fault Slughorn invited Hermione and me to a stupid party. Neither has wanted to go, you know, said Harry, firing up. Well, as I'm not invited to any parties, said Ron, getting to his feet again, I think I'll go to bed. He stomped off towards the door to the boys' dormitories, leaving Harry and Hermione staring after him. Oh, Demelza Robbins. What is Demelza Robbins' adjectives for her voice, please? Please give me uh, some adjectives for Demelza Robbins. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to think of how did Malfoy get his object into the school? What if he placed it on Harry? What if he placed it on Harry and Harry unwittingly brought it in? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what happened. 
That is what happened. He broke his nose, put whatever object this was on Harry, kind of like, did some kind of spell in it, and it got through. Okay, Demelza. Any adjectives for Demelza? Apparently not. Premonition? Okay, I'm just going to give Demelza some, some, uh, there's not really any description. Harry? No. Harry? 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 Said the new chaser Demelza Robbins, appearing suddenly at his shoulder. Got a message for you. I've got, I've got a message. I've got a message for you. I've got a message for you. From Professor Slughorn, asked Harry, sitting up hopefully. No, from Professor Snape, said Demelza. Harry's heart sank. He says you're to come to his office at half past eight tonight, or to do your detention, uh, no matter how many party invitations you received. And he wanted you to know you'll be sorting out rotten flubber worms from good ones to use in potions. And he says there's no need to bring protective gloves. Right, said Harry grimly. Thanks a lot, Demelza. <laughs> Chapter 12, Silver and Opals. If you were a Hogwarts student, how would you impress Slughorn so that he invites you to the Slug Club? Um, I just, I, I'd probably just, like, always show my money. I would be like, oh yeah, my mom, my mom just gave me money. Just always showing money, just wear rich clothes. Uh, uh, he definitely perk up at that and then i'd cheat on every single one of his tests so that he thinks i'm really good that should probably work for good old slughorn john would just read the slughorn <laughs> chat or just try to be funny that's actually true i'd probably try that too chapter 12 silver and opals where was dumbledore and what was he doing harry caught sight of the headmaster only twice over the next few weeks he rarely appeared at meals anymore, and Harry was sure Hermione was right in thinking that he was leaving the school for days at a time. Had Dumbledore forgotten the lessons he was supposed to be giving Harry? That's a little bit too good. He's doing good. Um, was he supposed to forgot the lessons? Dumbledore had said that the lessons were leading to something to do with a prophecy. Harry had felt bolstered, comforted, and now he felt slightly abandoned. Halfway through October came their first trip of the term to Hogsmeade. Harry had wondered whether these trips would still be allowed, given the increasingly tight security measures around the school, but was pleased to know that they were going ahead. It was al always good to get out of the castle grounds for a few hours. Harry woke early on the morning of the trip. Okay, one, se one second. So, the first trip to Hogsmeade, right, yeah. Okay, it's still happening. Harry woke, woke early on the morning of the trip, which was proving stormy, and whiled away the time until breakfast by reading his copy of Advanced Potion Making. He did not usually lie in bed reading his textbooks. That sort of behavior, as Ron rightly said, was indecent in anybody except Hermione, <laughs> who was simply weird that way. Harry felt, however, that the half-blued, half-blued princess, the half-blued princess copy of Advanced Potion Making hardly qualified as a textbook. The more Harry pored over the book, the more he realized how much was in there. Not only the handy hints and shortcuts on potions that were earning him such a glowing reputation with Slughorn, but, all, but also the imaginative little jinxes and hexes scribbled in the margins, which Harry was sure, judging by the crossing out and revisions, that the prince had invented himself. Harry had already... Yeah, it's interesting if I... Is that cheating? No, it's not cheating, because it's just a different way of making the same potion from the directions in the one book. No, it's not cheating. Harry had already attempted a few of the prince's self-invented spells. There had been a hex that caused toenails to grow alarmingly fast. He had tried this on Crab Bay in the corridor, with very entertaining results. <laughs> a jinx that glued the tongue, the tongue to the roof of the mouth, which he had used twice used to gen general applause on an unsuspecting Argus Filch. <sniffs> I don't know. Filch is a jerk, for sure. But maybe something that makes him a jerk is these kids always picking on him this way. I don't know. It's probably merited both ways. Uh, it's unofficial according to Hermione. Okay. Right, 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 right. Uh, okay. And perhaps most useful of all, Muffliate, muffliato, a spell that filled the ears of anyone nearby with an undefinable, un, unidentifiable buzzing. Oh, 
so that lengthy conversations could be held in class without being overheard. Huh. The only person who did not find these charms amusing was Hermione, who maintained a rigidly disapproving expression throughout and refused to talk at all if Harry had used the Muffliata spell on anyone in the vicinity. Half-Blood Prince? That's... That's Voldemort. It's Voldemort's book. I'm just realizing. It's Voldemort's book. Half-Blood? He's Half-Blood. He considers himself a prince, probably. In some way. It's Voldemort's book! And every single time he uses one of the spells, or I guess reads it, maybe makes, uh... Voldemort a bit stronger. Yeah, it's a premonition. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Don't confirm or deny it, please. Sitting up in bed, Harry turned the book sideways so as to examine more closely the scribbled instructions for a spell that seemed to have caused the prince some trouble. There were many crossing out, the crossings out and alterations, but finally crammed into a corner of the page, the scribble Levi Corpus in brackets N hyphen VBL. While the wind and sleet pounded relentlessly on the windows and Neville snored loudly, Harry stared at the letters in brackets, N-V-B-L. That had to mean non-verbal. Oh yeah, Harry rather doubted he would be able to bring off this particular spell. He was still having difficulties with, with non-verbal spells. Something Snape had been quick to, cut to comment on in every Dada class. Dada! Welcome to Dada class. Here in this class, we learn how to how to be good babies for Dada, because Dada always takes care of us. You know, so we we be good babies for Dada. Uh, enough of that. Am I right? Or should I ever do that again? Should I ever do that again? On the other hand, the prince had proved a <laughs> much more effective teacher than Snape so far. Yeah, Harry's a real bully in that way, attacking Felch, who can't defend himself from an applause from his colleagues. Totally. Totally. Um, pointing his wand at nothing in particular, he gave it an upward flick and said, Levi Corpus, inside his head. Ah! There was a flash of light and the room was full of voices. Everyone had woken up as Ron had let out a yell. Harry sent advanced potion, making flying in panic. Ron was dangling upside down in midair as though as though an invisible hook had hoisted him up by the ankle. Sorry, yelled Harry, as Dean and Seamus roared with laughter, and Neville picked himself up from the floor, having fallen out of bed. Hang on, uh, I'll, I'll let you down. He groped for, groped for the potion book and riffled through it in a panic, trying to find the right page. At last, he located it, and deciphered one cramped word underneath the spell, praying that this would, was the counter jinx. Harry thought, lib, lib, libra corpus, with all his might. While Harry was a bully to Filch, Filch did thre threaten Harry in his first year with torture, like actual torture. Yeah, that's true. That is very true. I mean, yes. But it didn't happen, though. He threatened it. He didn't do anything. Uh, there was another flash of light, and Ron fell in a heap on his mattress. Oh, sorry, repeated Harry weakly, while Dean and Seamus continued to roar with laughter. Tomorrow, said Ron in a muffled voice, I'd rather you set the alarm clock. By the time they had got dressed, patting themselves out with several of Mrs. Weasley's hand-knitted sweaters and carrying cloaks, scarves, and gloves, Ron's, Ron's shock had subsided, and he had decided that Harry's new spell was highly amusing. Uh, so amusing, in fact, that he had lost no time in regaling Hermione with a star story as they sat down for breakfast. And then there was another flash of light, and I landed on the bed again, grinned Ron. Uh, uh, helping himself to sausages. Hermione had not cracked a smile during this anecdote, and now turned an expression of wintry disapproval upon Harry. Was this spell, by any chance, another one from the potion book of yours? She asked. Harry frowned at her. Always jump to the worst conclusion, don't you? Was it? Well, yeah, it was, but so what? So you just decided to try out an unknown handwritten incantation and see what would happen? Why does it matter if it's handwritten, said Harry, preferring not to answer the rest of the question. Because it's probably not Ministry of Magic approved, said Hermione. And also, she added, as Harry and Ron rolled their eyes, because I'm starting to think this prince character was a bit dodgy. Both Harry and Ron shouted her down at once. It was a laugh! 
said Ron, upending a ketchup bottle over his sausages. It's a laugh, Hermione, that's all. Dangling people upside down by the ankle, said Hermione. Who puts their time and energy into making up spells like that? Fred and George, said Ron, shrugging. That kind of thing. And, uh... My dad, said Harry. He had only just remembered. What? said Ron and Hermione together. My dad used this spell, said Harry. I... Lupin told me. The last part was not true. In fact, Harry had seen his father use this spell on Snape. Oh, right! Yeah. But he had never told Ron and Hermione about that particular excursion into the Pensieve. Now, however, a wonderful possibility occur occurred to him. Could the Half-Blood Prince possibly be? I thought it might be his dad, but it's Voldemort. Maybe your dad did use it, Harry, said Hermione. But he's not the only one. We've seen a whole bunch of people use it, in case you've forgotten. Dangly people in the air, making them float along, asleep, helpless. All right! The, or, uh, the, the, the Death Eaters used it during the Quidditch World Cup. Wow. Harry stared at her. With a sinking feeling, he too remembered the behavior of the Death Eaters at the Quidditch World Cup. Ron came to his aid. That was different, he said robustly. They were abusing it. Harry and his dad were just having a laugh. You don't like the prince, Hermione, he added, pointing a sausage at her. Sternly, because he's better than you at potions. It's got nothing to do with that, said Hermione, her cheeks reddening. I just think it's very irresponsible to start performing spells when you don't even know what they're for, and stop talking about the prince as if it's his title. I bet it's just a stupid nickname, and it doesn't, even, and it doesn't seem as though he's a, he's a very nice person to me. I don't see where you get that from, said Harry repeatedly. Repeat, heatedly. If he'd been a budding Death Eater, he, would, he wouldn't have been boasting about be, being half-blood, would he? Even as he said it, Harry remembered that his father had been pure blood, but he pushed the thought out of his mind. He would worry about that later. The Death Eater can't all be pure blood. There aren't, even, e there aren't enough pure blood wizards, wizards left, said Hermione stubbornly. I expect most of them are, are half-bloods pretending to be pure. It's only muggle-borns they hate. I'd be quite happy to let you and Ron join up. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is a... This is not even mine. This is somebody's water glass from the house. It is so huge. Look, it's the size of my head. And it's great. Kind of fits to my body type, actually. For a lot of people, this is what normal glasses are like. I, I finally feel whole and complete. <laughs> Maybe it's a flower vase. It could totally be a flower vase. <laughs> um... And they'd love to have me, said Harry sarcastically. We'd be best pals if they didn't keep trying to do me in. This made Ron laugh. Even Hermione gave a grudging smile, and a distraction arrived in the shape of Ginny. Hey, Harry, I'm supposed to give you this. It was a roll of parchment with Harry's name written upon it with familiar, thin, slim, uh, slanting writing, writing. Thanks, Ginny. It's Dumbledore's next lesson, Harry told Ron and Hermione pulling open the parchment and quick, quickly reading its contents. Monday evening, he felt sudden... Oh, Monday evening, he felt suddenly light and happy. Want to join us in the Hogsmeade, Ginny? He asked. I'm going with Dean. Might see you there, she replied, waving at them as she left. Okay, uh... I'm gonna leave it there. We're gonna end there. That's been an hour. Uh, yeah. Nothing too crazy or exciting in this one, but, you know, you know, she... She balances out the writing of this pretty well. She does, like, exciting things, and then just regular school things. Romantic, then exciting, mysterious, etc., etc. There's a big rotation of, of different chapters and scenes. Um, yeah, okay, just a reminder. Wednesday and Thursday, I'm not reading. Tuesday and Friday, Friday I am this week. I will be going home. Uh, always enjoy this. I'm a bit tired today. I don't know why. So I'm going to just be logging off with big fanfare. Hope you have a wonderful night. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you tomorrow for more Harry Potter and Conk's Corner. Love you all. Bye-bye.